Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Melvin. It's a fascinating story, isn't it? And there's something incredibly powerful about the fact that one of those Bibles is sitting in the corner. You can almost feel the reverberations coming from it, the history that it's holding. Um, I want just very briefly to pick up on two areas uh, and reflect on them. Uh, the first, uh, obviously, is the Bible. And the second is this question of dying for your faith. Um, the Bible is part of what stops us from making God in our own image. The Bible faces us with the reality that we're part of something much bigger than our individual story. Um, also, we get that sense when we're reading the Bible that it's not exactly our own idea. How do we get this particular collection of books rather than the many other books uh, that were around during the process in which the Bible comes into a consolidated canon. Um, if you read the Hebrew scriptures, you know that it speak, they speak of other collections of prophecies and histories that are now lost to us. And in the first couple of Christian centuries, there were other sources that were widely read, but for some reason don't make it into what we think of as the Bible. One of the major uh, reformed theologians of the last century speaks of the Bible having imposed itself on us. Not exactly our choice, but imposed on us. Um, and I think the theology of this is that, uh, importantly, we do not pick and choose what will be constitutive of our faith. Instead, our faith constitutes us making us part of this much bigger narrative, the one that starts with the creation of the world and ends with its fulfillment, Genesis to Revelation. And in the meantime, draws us into the company of people from all times and all places. I can't help noticing that I could be describing either the church or the Bible in that sentence, and I want to say something about how those two interact, these two great gifts that keep us truthful. One of the things that comes so powerfully out of um, Melvin's telling of Tyndale's uh, story is that Tyndale and all other translators of the Bible um, show us something of the sheer attention and love called out by faith. Melvin, I think you mentioned that we don't even know how Tyndale learnt Hebrew. He just seems to have taught it himself, Hebrew, as he sort of rolled around Europe uh, with never a penny to rub together, but somehow uh, learned enough Hebrew to start translating the Old Testament. Um, that kind of love and attention mean that it matters that the words are right. But I think it also shows us something of the Christian theology of human and divine interaction. The Bible is gift. It comes to us. But it's also ours to work at. For example, it can be translated, that's the whole story that we're looking at, it can be translated into all the different languages in the world without fear of losing its reality because it's a witness to the reality of God rather than being that reality itself. If you go into a theological library, there are shelves and shelves and shelves of commentaries. Uh, if you go to any Christian church anywhere around the world on any Sunday, there will be sermons after sermons after sermons, um, probably with an element of repetition in some of them, dare we say, but also this element of constant newness. As an expositor of the Bible myself, I'm constantly amazed that you can open the same text week after week and find something that I, you were pretty sure words wasn't there last time you looked. There's something new that comes out as each person brings something of themselves to the task of reading and interpreting the Bible. And so the Bible's story gets richer and richer and richer as more and more people are come, come to be part of that story. We become part of the story that makes us. It's like a kind of regular feeding of the 5,000, where one passage of scripture can be taken and blessed and feed hearts and minds over and over. 
But it does have obvious dangers. And they were the kind of dangers that worried some of Tyndale's opponents, notably Thomas More, as Melvin's been describing to us. Um, this gift of scripture put into every person's hands is a glorious gift, but it is dangerous. Um, it uh, enables each person to interact and begin to form their own faith. Uh, it's an unusual attitude to authority and begins definitely to change the understanding uh, of how authority operates in church and in state. Um, but I'm not entirely sure that that's quite what Tyndale and other early translators intended. Um, Tyndale, uh, as Melvin has highlighted for us, puts an enormous amount of emphasis on the congregation. Um, he trusts uh, the authority of the congregation. Um, Tyndale and those early translators who worked so hard to get the Bible into all of our hands probably couldn't imagine the way that we use it now when we sit on our own reading the bits that we like best and deciding for ourselves what it all means. Remember, uh, in Tyndale's day, very few people could read fluently. Printing was, its, when it was in its infancy and hadn't yet spawned the literate world that is part of the legacy of Bible translating and printing. Bible and printing grow a reading world. So Tyndale may well have been imagining faithful people reading scripture but he was almost certainly envisaging them doing that together, God's people and God's book in connection. Not the plowboy out in the field on his own, but the authority of the congregation. Certainly Cranmer, the great architect of English Christianity, assumed that most people would gain access to the life-giving word through liturgy, through hearing it read and expounded in the congregation congregation of the faithful. It's easy to romanticize the Bible as the great tool in the hands of the laity, freeing them from dependence on the clergy to mediate their relationship with God. Um, I certainly, as a lay person myself, have found that um, an important part of my faith to be able to access scripture directly. Even when you can't join with the congregation, you can open your Bible and be part of the company of the faithful. But I think that's part of the point, that the Bible, uh, like the church, pulls you into this company of people that are not your own choice, not necessarily your own mindset. The Bible refuses to allow faith to become a club or an individual pastime. Perhaps those of us who are regular Bible users need to ensure that we use it responsibly, honoring those like Tyndale, who sacrificed so much to put it into our hands. And that sacrifice is the other thing that I want very briefly to touch on. Was it worth it? Are there things worth dying for? Is being prepared to die for something on a kind of continuous line that might end in being prepared to kill for something. It's hard to overestimate the impact of having the Bible in our own language. But history suggests that it would have happened even if Tyndale had given up when it got dangerous. But the problem is that Tyndale lived that side of history, not this. He had no way of knowing when he started that others would pick up his work, and that even as he went to his death for his endeavors, the Bible in English was becoming acceptable. He could hardly have imagined our world where the Bible is so readily available in every language and format that mostly we take no notice of it at all. There surely must be things of such value to us and to our world that we can't afford to leave it to chance and hope that all will be well if we don't pay too high a price ourselves. Tyndale believed, and I want to say rightly, that the Bible is too important to be in the hands of only a few, and he was prepared to die for that truth. Would he have killed others to impose it? 
I don't think he would. Um, Melvin will know better, having spent so much longer in Tyndale's company. I think that dying for what you believe and killing for what you believe are not much of a muchness. And I think that on the basis of the, w of the way of Jesus Christ. Christians have sadly and painfully often not made the connection with the fact that Jesus chose to die but did not choose to impose his will by force. We all know the sorry history of Christian tyranny. But there is also that profound saying, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And that's a statement of Christology. It's a statement about Jesus Christ, the truth revealed. Whereas the statement might is right is not Christology. That's not about Jesus Christ, God revealed. There must be some things worth dying for. Some things so constitutive of what we are and what we long for the world to be that if we forswear them, we forswear all that makes life worth living. Tyndale's belief that we all need to be able to access the Bible made Tyndale who he was. Without that belief, there is no Tyndale we would not be telling his story hundreds of years later. So I suppose another part of Tyndale's challenge to us is what would we die for? And then the most basic challenge, this book that he died for. Does it matter enough? I'll let you ask those questions and hope that Mark will answer them. <laughs>